Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. And now, I mean, this guest, James K. Galbraith, is one of the most famous economists we have in the country. And I'm, I can't resist saying also the offspring of, I think, probably the most valuable. Well, actually, he was Canadian to begin with, your father. Uh, but clearly, uh, from when I was in graduate school studying economics, my hero uh, was your father, uh, uh, the great Professor Galbraith, who, and I, I, I'm going to end with this uh, discussion about a work of his called The Affluent Society, which I think was way ahead of his time, but it really was discussing how do we deal with being, having such wealth, such affluence, such power, and yet having tranquility, having happy population, catering to the needs of people, who, to my mind, it's it's the ultimate refutation of, of Adam Smith, if you like. Uh, but we can discuss that uh, right now. We want to we're here to talk about the current problem with the economy, the problem with banking, problem with inflation. And you wrote a very uh, interesting, provocative, uh, thoughtful article for the Nation magazine, which, by the way, I would point out is the uh, oldest continuously publishing uh, political journal in the United States, whether of the left or the right. Uh, and uh, they have had a tradition over a long time now, uh, well, well, over a century of uh, covering what's going on with the economy. And your headline is quite provocative. It's what Elizabeth Warren, Lauren, Larry Summers and Paul Krugman. So that's Lar Larry Summers was the one who engineered a lot of the mischief on Wall Street. Elizabeth Warren was is a popular senator who tried to challenge it. Paul Krugman has been the go-to uh, le liberal of some conscience, uh, as opposed to neoliberal, who's tried to criticize him. But they're saying they all got it wrong about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And what, I, what intrigued me was your subheadline. It's a war for the dollar. And the big banks, the rest of us better hold on tight. So what is this war for the dollar and the big banks? Well, uh, just to begin with, let me uh, specify for your listeners what that what what I intended. Well, and the text that underlay that headline. Uh, the, the headline is, of course, always the editor rather than the uh, than the author. But in this case, it it you know it it's provocative in a in I think a useful way. Uh, and what. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren and the others were, I think, focused on uh, was the uh, the management of this particular bank. Uh, and my point was that if this uh, were the really the source of the difficulty, uh, then we wouldn't have a banking crisis, a problem. We wouldn't have wouldn't be talking about contagion because it would be a one off thing there was a bank which uh, did something wrong and this is this was characteristic by the way also of the uh, 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 the focus in the two in the last crisis when uh, the problem was largely with the failure of regulation to control the quality of mortgages that were being made that led to a vast well, that was actually very widespread in the banking system and led to a vast number of failures well in this case, my argument is the source of the difficulty is the policy that is being pursued by the Federal Reserve. And while Silicon Valley Bank was exceptionally vulnerable to that policy, uh, it was by far, far from being the only bank that's vulnerable to it and far from being, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, it's not at all as though it were uh, it had a, a, a loan book that was failing or something of that nature. What was what was happening is it was vulnerable to the rise of interest rates, which affects the whole banking system. And that's why we see uh, the, um, the threat of contagion and the measures that are being taken to try and contain it. The, Fed, the Federal Reserve's policy is the source of this problem. So why is this, uh, again, your, your subtitle or whether the editor's subtitle, it's a war for the dollar? And the big banks. Well, that gets to the question of why the Federal Reserve has pushed up the short-term interest rate as far as it has. Uh, there's a whole, of course, dialogue or let's say monologue about that that comes from high authorities. They're always you know, acting in the public interest and fighting inflation. But this is very hard to, to take seriously at this point. Uh, the inflation rate has peaked 
nine months ago and has been falling. Uh, they, uh, there's a lot of talk about tight labor markets, but in fact, wages are lagging behind prices. And so what we call the real wage uh, has actually been falling. And that's the, that's the variable that economists think if they think about labor markets is the one that, that, that should be the, you know, you know a, the test of whether the labor market is tight. So it, logically and empirically, these public justifications uh, are hard are hard to take all that seriously. It, so the real question is: Are they is the Federal Reserve really convinced by by its own rhetoric, or is it motivated by some other some other forces? And, uh, I my strong uh, let's say uh, let's call it a suspicion or uh, you know sense of the matter is that. Uh, the underlying motivations, first of all, are the interests of the large banks, and secondly, the uh, the the strength of the U.S. dollar in the world situation, where the dollar whose position is for the first time in about 40 years a little more precarious than it has been, uh, and so that's where I would look for the underlying sources of the motivation behind this policy. So let me just you raise a number of questions. First of all, I most of us have trouble understanding just what the federal Reserve Board does and who they represent and so forth. But just on the surface of it, to say the big problem in America now is a tight labor market, which means finally people working at Starbucks or at Whole Foods or someplace, Amazon, maybe getting up to 20 bucks an hour or something. Uh, that's you know, really not even a living wage, even though we say the living wage is like around 15. Uh, this tight labor market at least brings some of the loot of the most affluent society, the most successful economy in, in world history uh, to some to the masses of people. That something labor unions used to do. It used to be, you know, when I was growing up, my relatives and everything and my parents, they could get a job, a union job, maybe at the U.S. Steel, at the automobile, some United Elect Electrical Workers, and have, you know, a decent wage, pay their bills and so forth. Now this Federal Reserve Board seems determined uh, to hold down wages, uh, you know, at a time where they don't hold down corporate profits, they don't hold down executive wages. We've had this incredible explosion over the last 40 years of income gap and so forth. And yet the big enemy, and as you point out, real wages ha haven't actually increased very much. Uh, what's going on? Is this politics by another game? And is it uh, 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 establishment politics benefiting the rich? And one other thing I'd just like to ask you about the Federal Reserve. I remember in the other, the big banking meltdown, uh, when Timothy Geithner was the head of the New York Fed, and he'd been in the Treasury, went back to the U.S. Treasurer, his whole concern was to save the big banks, uh, funnel money, you know, through AIG and all that to save the big banks. So what is the Federal Reserve? Is it an agency of, of the most powerful, richest people and enabling them to get more? Well, uh, the Federal Reserve is a central bank and the central bank is a banker to banks. Uh, and the Federal Reserve was always constructed to be responsive, uh, to have, be, have the voices of the banking system strongly represented. As the banking systems become more and more concentrated in the hands of the very largest banks, well, their voices have have, have gained ever more weight. Uh, I don't think there's really any any any, any mystery to that. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the you effect on- There's justice to that. That's what I'm getting at, is this serving the people. I no, mean, of course not. I mean, it, of course not. The Federal Reserve was originally established uh, as a, a, an entity that was going to be controlled by the, the by the large banks. Uh, Roosevelt in the New Deal altered that and uh, gave place the 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 center of power in Washington with the Board of Governors. But over time, the Board of Governors has uh, you know it's come. In, very highly responsive, well, to the to the to the bank. So the question of who whose interests are represented there uh, is, I think, you know, it's it's fairly straightforward. That it's not all that different uh, from what it was at the beginning, with a very heavy weight to the views of the big banks. Uh, now let's go and talk a little bit uh, about wages here, because yes, you're quite right. There's a strong case in equity. There's a strong social case. 
and there's a strong economic case uh, for bringing up the wages of all these uh, the vast numbers of American workers, a large majority of them, uh, who work for relatively low wages. And I've always been an advocate of a of a minimum wage, which was a decent, uh, modest living wage. Fifteen dollars an hour uh, is, uh, you know, has been the, the the target for quite some time. Some states have taken that and made that their wage, but it's not it's not yet reached the level of being, uh, you know, successfully implemented at the national level. This would be good. It would not be inflationary, uh, and it would not justify a rise in interest rates to counteract it. But that's not what's happening. What's happening actually is a rise in interest rates when the wage rate on average hasn't risen as much as prices. So that these workers are not gaining ground, they're losing ground, and yet interest rates are going up anyway. And so I just ask the question, why is that? What is the justification here? Even if you take uh, the, you know, the, the, the textbook view of uh, how, as I say, labor markets are supposed to work. This is not, that, that view would not support this policy. So that leads me to say, you know, look, is something else going on here? Uh, and that's why I, I come back to this question of what is the role of the of of the uh, uh, sense of the of, of the dollar in the world system as a motive force behind what's going on. So what does that mean that we're backing the dollar as opposed to if we were on the gold standard, we wouldn't have to back gold. It would seem to find some natural outlet. People have access to it. It's not controlled by one government, right? That was the sort of beauty of a standard like that. It was kind of neutral in, in, in effect. Uh, and, you know, if that were the standard, when you have dollar, the dollar being the standard, it obviously favors the country that can print these dollars that can control the outflow and so forth. Uh, and and uh, what, that is being challenged now, isn't it? Because, for instance, I just looking at the latest figures for March that India and China are buying most of Russia's oil now at just the highest point, and they're buying it in their local currency. They're not using the dollar because we have uh, these punishments against Russia over the Ukraine. But still, it's challenging the dollar. And, and if Saudi Arabia gets into that, then now, uh, you know, Iran and Syria, because they also, uh, you know, and particularly Iran uh, and Iraq with oil, uh, the challenge to the dollar might not be a good thing for U.S. power, but it might be a, a good thing for more rational allocation of rewards and resources in the world, might it not? Well, uh, this is... You know, a question of perspective. <laughs> let's let's just say that it's a fact uh, that uh, a significant part of the world economy, uh, of the major players in the world economy, are insulating themselves from transactions in the in in, in the dollar, from passing uh, transactions, for example, in oil through the dollar. Why are they doing this? Well, they're doing this because uh, the sanction regime that was uh, placed on the Russian Federation uh, has made it clear that uh, transactions in the dollar might not be entirely secure, and that reserves held in dollars uh, can be frozen and might even be confiscated. And so if you're in the position of doing a lot of international transactions, uh, you uh, you know, it's very plausible and rational to start doing them uh, in ways that don't involve uh, vulnerability to that kind of uh, that kind of policy. So, in some sense, the, the if you like the the uh, I, I wouldn't say the dollar is under attack. Uh, I would say that the policies that were implemented for a different reason uh, have had the effect of undermining confidence in the dollar. Uh, in by certain major players in the world. Uh, and so we are seeing the emergence of a non-dollar uh, and also non-euro zone uh, in world trade and commerce, which is the first time that's happened seriously in, uh, in, in well, in quite a long time. But, uh, they uh, maybe really since the second, before the Second World War. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, and that's something which uh, I would uh, at least plausibly believe would concern both the Federal Reserve and the major American banks, uh, and that would 
would in there would lead toward, uh, let's say, a policy of of bringing money into the United States, which is which is what if, is the effect of raising short term interest rates. So that, in some sense, keeps the value of the dollar from being affected uh, in the, at least in the short run uh, by uh, by the, by the uh, by the emergence of a non-dollar zone. Okay, but let, let's look at this language a bit. It's not an attack on the dollar. It might be a divorce. Uh, in, in the same way you could have a divorce in a marriage, and that we we or we don't want to play in your playground anymore. We don't trust it. Because after all, if you can suddenly make all of our savings disappear or freeze our assets or what have you, then the dollar is no longer a neutral agency of exchange. It's a vehicle of U.S. policy and and uh, and those who follow it closely. And it seems to me here I want to get into this larger question. The, the challenge from China, because obviously it's a much more economically significant than country than, say, Russia, obviously, but also uh, the BRIC alliance. The, we would take countries like Brazil. Now even South Africa is open to this. Certainly India here, where India and China have been shooting at each other and everything, but they now seem to be moving to a common perspective that there needs to be a multipolar world. There shouldn't be all this power centered in a hegemonic um, uh, uh, U.S., and I just want to ask you, aren't the plates shifting that we're really developing a very different or well, the potential for a very different world economy? And connected with that is people who produce raw materials saying we want to get in on the other end. Now, for instance, China saying, well, OK, we got this cheap labor, but that's going to run out. Our population is starting to decline as it should with prosperity. The whole world has always wanted population control of some kind or other. And they're saying, we want to make more advanced chips. We're going to make better cars. We're even going to make airplanes. And and isn't this really about asserting U.S. power over the world economy? Well, I think the effort to turn the, the dollar system into an instrument of U.S. policy, the means you've just described, uh, is an effort to exert U.S. power. And it's one which is going to, in effect, uh, bring on countermeasures. That's, I think, you know, this is what one should expect to happen. And it, it seems to me that it is happening. Uh, so uh, what is the source of the, of, of, of the tension? Well, I mean, there are lots of issues here. But, but fundamentally, it seems to me that 20, 30 years ago, uh, it was plausible to view the Chinese economy as complementary to the U.S. one. That is to say, we supplied capital goods and uh, uh, advanced technologies and, uh, and, and also consumer standards of, to Chinese industry, which then supplied us with very large quantities of, of basic uh, consumer goods and clothing and appliances and electronics and the whole, whole range of things. Uh, and this was a, a relationship that uh, built up uh, considerable uh, interconnection between the two countries. But in the course of, 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 of events, of course, the Chinese uh, industries get better and better at doing what they do. And they move up the ladder of technologies and they become, instead of uh, complements, they become effectively competitors at the high level. And that is going to create tension. Well, that seems to be that. So that's, that's a, a very neutral way of describing uh, what the process we are now at, uh, or the place that we are now at, where uh, what was essentially a, a, a symbiotic relationship becomes a competitive one. Oh, well, okay, that's in the nature of, uh, of, of, of events, if you like. When you say it's symbiotic, essentially, it was essentially an exploitive relationship. And I, I just, the reason I'm pushing these questions with you is I, I read a couple of your books, and I think that you are one of our big thinkers. And I'm not saying that to flatter you, but in so much of the discussion about economics, we don't get to sort of bigger concepts and choices and so forth. But the uh, two books that, that you've written, one, The Predator State, and the other, The End of Normal, and they're about 10 years apart or eight years apart, 08 and I believe 16, 2016, 2008, there's a theme running through them. 
One is that we never had this illusion of the free market, that there never really was a free market. Even You have a wonderful description somewhere in your writing about Adam Smith's Scotland and, and how basically the view from Scotland, that they really didn't have anything. All they did was have access to the English empire's market. And so they could take advantage of India, for example. And, and it never was going to be equal. It was always going to be exploitive. And, and uh, you know, it would always be predatory in a way that was economic colonialism. And then in the end of normal, you're really talking about why people won't necessarily accept situations of exploitation and disadvantage. So I want to get to those big ideas because I think with China, for example, uh, you know, and, and again, I mentioned your father's book, The Affluent Society. I thought was a, a work of genius. I must say, as a graduate student, I read that book. It changed my life, you know, because really it, it basically said, okay, some people are going to get really wealthy. Wealth is going to be created. But how are you going to spread it around? Who's going to get advantage from it? Are you going to make an, uh, spread it around enough so you have stability, so you don't have wars, you don't have hunger, you don't have uh, racism and tension? and so forth. It seems to me that's where we are now. The issue with China or India is not just nationalism. They happen to have between them almost, what, three billion people. They have a big chunk of the world's population. If those people don't have a good life, where is human rights? If they can't pay their bills, if they have to work in sweatshops or little Apple concentration camps, assembling iPhones, if they can't get to the high end of production, where you can maybe buy, get a fishing boat and maybe have a car in the garage, etc. It seems to me there's a social justice question at issue here now in the reordering of the world economy. I just would like to get you to comment on that. Well, let me let me take up the affluent society just for for a minute here. It's a very important book in my life, and in part because it's partly dedicated to me, uh, so it has a uh, has some personal importance. Uh, but I think the first of all, the underlying premise of the book, which is as you say, is that uh, in the particularly in the post war era, and for the first time uh, in the United States. The, the basic material needs of most people were being met, uh, food, how, a shelter, clothing, and so forth. Uh, and so th this was a, a question, the question that came up was, uh, well, the distribution was a part of it, but a much more important part of it was what my father called social balance, uh, what he called the problem of private opulence and public squalor. Uh, and th th this, this is a crucial element in assuring that the society has a, uh, let's say, a broad um, solidarity with its entire population. Uh, the environment is an extremely important part of that, but also the quality of, of urban life, the ability, the, the access to parks and to cultural facilities and to, to essentially things which are more, uh, which exist on a higher plane than both private profit and uh, the accumulation of personal possessions. And this was a, the big message of the affluent society. And it sparked in many ways the, the, the counterculture movements of, of, of my youth in the, in the 1960s. Uh, and it sparked, it supported the civil rights movement. It underpinned Lyndon Johnson's great society in a very important way. Uh, so this was all part of, of, of um, you know, in some sense, the ethos of that book, which was a substantially pushed aside in the beginning in the, in the late 70s and 80s in the Reagan era. Uh, these questions were not, were no longer considered to be um, uh, a, um, you know, central uh, uh, in, in, in American politics. Um, and so that we, we, we regressed in terms of the, uh, of the quality of our discourse on these matters. Uh, my book, The Predator State, um, which was in some sense uh, you know, a, a derivative of another one of my father's books, The New Industrial State, that came out in 1967, was also an important book. But my book was about the way in which American politics was 
built on the contest over existing social institutions like Medicare, like Social Security, where the pressure is these things now exist and do provide important social protections, that the political battles become over shaving off uh, parts of them for the benefit of private in- interests. Uh, you know, a nice example was the way Medicare Part D, which was an expansion of the of that program under the Bush administration was constructed, but without any effective control over the price of drugs. So it was very good for for the pharmaceutical producers, this kind of thing, using the established state apparatus to support powerful clients, which is the very far from being a free market approach to economics. It's 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 really it, it, crony capitalism can be called, is is one way of talking about it. But I thought the phrase the predator state captured what was going on uh, fairly effectively. Uh, so uh, what's what do we see uh, in um, well what do we see notably in China? Uh, I think there's a fair statement is that we see. Uh, f- first of all, the idea, the concept of modest prosperity is a real thing. It's uh, the idea that 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 deep poverty should be eliminated, but also the idea that the urban centers that where most Chinese now live, uh, big transformation in the last forty years as China has become an urban country on a scale that's never before been seen. That these centers should be decent places to live. Uh, that they should be reasonably orderly, clean. They should have good transportation. All kinds of things uh, that have been built up in 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 in, in Chinese life, uh, and that I think, it, it, uh, in some sense, uh, is uh, it's an important uh, element of uh, the stability, solidarity of 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 Chinese society. Well, but this is a big deal. Uh, because in, in, in the reporting in the United States, basically about it, that is just seen as verbiage. You know, uh, now uh, Z has the slogan "Common Prosperity." I noticed the statistic uh, just recently, this week, that the number of billionaires in China uh, has declined. I don't know how they calculate it, but there seems to be some consensus of that the swings have ha- got to be curtailed. A mass transit is actually thought to be valuable, uh, and uh, that the quality of air, I mean, you can't breathe in it, Beijing during part of the year. Uh, and, and this all really goes back, uh, if we go back to Adam Smith, this kind of goes back to the teachings of, uh, attributed to Confucius, uh, basically, or you could even go to Aristotle, that how to be a good emperor. You know that you have to take care of, of the people. You have to. There has to be some measure of accountability, at least to your own population. In the case of China and India, you're talking about a good chunk of the world's population. You know. Yeah. Well, this this is. I think you're you're, you're right that there is a uh, an element here of what makes what makes a ruling, uh, high, uh, let's say, a ruling elite legitimate. Is its ability to maintain, um, you know, social stability and a sense of progress. China is full of problems. Uh, the in, the inequality and in the income distribution got very, very aggravated uh, over it over the thirty years of the reform. Uh, the corruption, undoubtedly, a major question, uh, and uh, environment. Uh, and the deter- deterioration of the air and the water, uh, extremely important questions. Uh, they whether those questions can be dealt with, will will be dealt with, is a, you know, a test going forward of the of, of the resilience of the system. But what what is I think reasonably clear is that the system does have a record of responding uh, to. Uh, problems and crises in the past. And one that most remarkable recent case was, of course, the pandemic, uh, where the where, where, where China was able and did mobilize its whole society uh, to keep the virus under control. It relaxed that and the virus spread very rapidly in recent times. Uh, but uh, that was a, a, a different variant uh, and one which had much less effect on the stability of Chinese society. Uh, than it would have would have been the case had it not been contained in 2020 when 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 it was running uh, raging throughout the rest of the world. So I mean again you can see this. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it, 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 these these questions. There's no guarantee 
uh, in the Chinese case that things will continue to be stable and continue to be uh, that there will you know success is never guaranteed indefinitely, uh, but uh, you can you can be quite sure I think that the broad vast uh, body of the Chinese population uh, has not yet been disaffected from its governing structures. You know, it's interesting, the uh, uh, use of language. And I, I think uh, the, the American framework, uh, which, again, I think the, your father's writing challenged in a certain brand of liberalism. I don't know if it exists much anymore, but, you know, the whole idea of the U.N. and, and so forth. And it's been pointed out, even in our occupation of Japan with somebody like Douglas MacArthur, who, you know, no one thought of him as a great social pioneer, but the constitution that he created for Japan and also how we influenced Germany after the war and the distribution of land in Japan, all have contained a kind of what uh, social justice notion, you know, the big land holdings were broken up under our military occupation. Uh, the rights of of women were affirmed, uh, you know, and, and this happened a great deal in Germany. Now we're into a different mood where it's, it's, we are centric, our well-being is centric to it, and we have all the answers. We don't look to any of these other societies. And, and it's really, um, you know, it's very odd. I, I happen to have been in Russia and reviewed Gorbachev's book when it first came out on perestroika and so forth. And you know, uh, and I remember at the time there was a sort of celebration. No, this is not the right way. Uh, uh, we, we, there has to be this open capitalism and so forth. And that gave rise to cartels and everything. Now you look at Russia and this guy Putin, we still treat him as if he's the head of a communist party. But he, in fact, was the anti-communist. OK, he defeated the guy. He had been, yes, an uh, apparatchik. But he then ran. He was the guy Yeltsin picked. We supported and so forth. Yet. Looking at the situation now, there's an alliance between an anti-communist Russian leader and a communist-run China, <laughs> and, and which never happened under the umbrella of communism, allying and actually getting support uh, from uh, Brazil, from uh, South Africa, from much of a lot of parts of the rest of the world, that maybe we don't have the language, we don't have all the critical ideas, because you just mentioned this two words, you know, the, uh, how did you put it, the, uh, uh, pub, your, from your father, the uh, private opulence and public, public squalor. 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 How could be the basis of a national teaching? How did American democracy come to be, produce the exact, op I mean, if there was any notion at all, and in, in built in and de Tocqueville described it, and the hopes of American democracy, it was some kind of expanding, basically, class of what, uh, <laughs> of apprentices, of workers, of, of, of farmers, of, of, of middle class, yes, white, yes, led by males, yes, yes. But still, there had to be this, this expanding, um, what, whatever you want to call it, not an elitist society. Okay. Let, let, let's take this back, if you like, a, 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 almost a century now to the, to the early 1930s uh, and ask what the options were in the world at that time. And there were basically three. Uh, there, was, there was Soviet communism, uh, which uh, was uh, really very effective at industrialization, but also very brutal. Uh, and of course, far from you know, the absolutely opposite of democratic, there was European fascism, uh, which was also highly militaristic and very brutal. Uh, and there was the American New Deal. What there was not was any sense that uh, the traditional uh, laissez-faire capitalism of the of the 19th century was going anywhere in the world. There was just simply nothing, no 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 constituency for it. Uh, of the three models, by far and away the most successful was the American New Deal. Uh, it was a, if you like, a post-capitalist or a, a, a development which uh, created both the welfare state and uh, the public 
uh, the public sector, or the public infrastructure, and all kinds of uh, of, uh, of dimensions, a vast construction project, which is all around us uh, even today. Now, uh, so uh, then we ask, okay, the aftermath of the Second World War, what happened? Well, one of the things that happened it happened in Asia, but also to a degree in Europe, was that the American New Deal spread. It spread to Japan, spread to Korea, spread to Germany. Uh, it was part and parcel of the reconstruction of those regions. Uh, and it was highly successful in that respect, blending with, with, the, with the earlier you know, social and cultural and economic forms, uh, but very, very influential. Uh, one of the major uh, sources of that influence was a certain New Dealer who happened to be my father. Who was had a deep following in in Japan. He was also part of the of the early reconstruction of German of Western Germany, uh, and he was influential in Korea. And by the way, he was very carefully followed and read uh, in uh, in China, especially in the early period following uh, the death of Mao Zedong uh, in the seventies. So, so one 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 has here is in some sense a model that evapor has been decaying and evaporating in the United States, but taken up in a lot of other places with the results that we see. What happened in the United States, again, and, and in Britain too, with the Thatcher-Reagan ideological revolution, was, an, was a strong pushback on everything that was public, everything that was done by the government, everything that was social insurance, uh, everything that was collective. Uh, and uh, we can see, you know, the consequences of this now are really um, beginning to, you know, in a serious way to show. So, uh, Bob, I was, I was interrupting before because your father was also uh, the ambassador to India, wasn't he? That is true. Yeah. And, and, and so when you think about it, uh, uh, this I think is really, I mean, this is worth the whole podcast as far as I'm concerned, this mm -hmm. notion that this was our gift to the world at that time. That, that yes, communism had failed. It was brutal and it was inefficient in the long run because it did not did not have a component of consumer sovereignty. It did not have a market notion of accountability. And so a bureaucracy uh, would have become ever more brutal and, and coercive and inefficient. And and uh, what, uh, and, and, you know, I guess you could throw... Uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, there's a bunch of these intellectuals who actually suddenly were world-class figures. And they advanced a notion of enlightened uh, democratic capitalism, whatever you want to call it. You could call it social democracy. It was represented sometimes by social democratic parties in Europe and, uh, and sometimes by people who claim to be more conservative. But all of them accepted a notion of uh, not having vast income disparity and being accountable in the way you described it. What I want to, I mean, when, before we leave to, to here, because I think we have a big picture idea here, what happened was it's not just the Ronald Reagans and the Thatchers. It's also, dare I say, Bill Clinton. <laughs> and uh, and uh, no, There's no question. Yeah, no. I mean, it, it, Reagan, Reagan was, uh, in some sense, the turning point here. Uh, but uh, by the time the Democrats came back in uh, with 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 Clinton uh, and then onwards, uh, they had absorbed they they had the less the political lesson they had learned was that they, they needed to mouth the same platitudes that were coming out of uh, out of the Reagan uh, Reagan era. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some sense, the Republicans were always more realistic about this. This is why I subtitled the, the predator state, how conservatives abandoned the free market and why liberals should, too. Because the conservatives were, these were, were you know, particularly when the time you got to the Bushes, this was plainly a corporate. Uh, a corporate state. It was, uh, you know, it was a state that was being run by the former chief executive of Halliburton. Uh, if you need more than that, you don't, you know, you're not seeing clearly what was going on. Uh, but the, but the, the, de the Democrats, for partly for out of protective political coloration, embraced the rhetoric of small government, free markets, and all of this, uh, and they, they, they pursued the same agenda 
of deregulation, which once had was deeply embedded in the financial system, was just a recipe for for, for a meltdown, for a disaster. Uh, and we're seeing we're seeing the consequences as well of failure to maintain core infrastructure, uh, which has been going on for a long time. So this is something I mean we, we have to grasp because it's always being presented now as a fight for democracy and freedom against totalitarianism, and. Uh, you know, and so therefore we're justified, you know, in really reversing Richard Nixon's wisdom and Henry Kissinger's wisdom in trying to include even Mao Zedong's communist China in the work of all nations. Uh, we now uh, have this thing we, we were, you know, uh, hostile to private companies like Huawei and, and China and the daughter of the founder ends up being in the house arrest in Vancouver. And they are by definition the enemy. And in, in India, you have a, a Trump-like figure, but he's the enemy because also he has to care about India. And whether you're, you know, the right or the left in Brazil, you have to care about all the people who live in Brazil. Is it the real issue now whether ordinary folks throughout the world get a say in what's going on i love this image i'm gonna i'm gonna be drunk on this for probably what remains of my life private opulence and public squalor the reason and i guess it's which book is it in of your father that's in the affluent society oh great uh, by the way can we agree on that everyone should read the affluent society i mean i no really i i i i I put it way above Marx's capital or, you know, or, I, I mean, there's just, it's just, or uh, Wealth of Nations, by the way, my students have never heard of Adam Smith or Wealth of Nations or Ricardo or any of the people that I studied, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Stuart Mills, any of the great thinkers. But this idea, what else, what better way to Smith, describe? Smith, by the way, remains worth reading. He's, he's, he's far from being the, 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 the stick figure of the, of that, the, that the, you know, libertarian conservative thought has made, have made him out to be, uh, full of interesting insights and, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, humane judgment. So I, I, I was put in a word for the real Adam Smith over the caricature that has come down. Oh, to us. I'm not putting down Adam Smith. Yeah. And by the way, I don't put down libertarians. If libertarians were, were when they're consistent, when they're consistent, Yes, a free market would mean breaking up, uh, you know, Google. You know, it would mean uh, having uh, not having these trade agreements that favor uh, cartels all over the right. place. Right. Well, these are all, you know, they're, they're, as I say, they're, they're fantasies because you know, how many search net uh, engines would you really? Uh, would you do you want to have to go through in order to find something? The real issue with large entities is to, to keep them. Uh, you know, effectively regulated so that they remain stable and they serve public purpose. Yeah, uh, you to... can't, you, you wouldn't want to break up a nuclear reactor into 10 smaller reactors. But you do, if you have a nuclear reactor, you want to make sure it's properly controlled. I That's understand. the essence of it. I understand. But the essence of Adam Smith, you know, here I am, the guy who uh, <laughs> got, pushed, got pushed out of graduate school and became a journalist. But but the fact of the matter is there was a wisdom to the invisible hand of the market, which is that you no one got to control it. And what we began this discussion with was a mechanism of control, the Federal Reserve. I don't want to be a, a conspiracy theorist here and, and rail against the Federal Reserve. But there's something truly ab absurd about what happened to the American economy when, you know, you had the financial services modernization act. I remember at the time I was working for the LA Times. I, I sat there in, in Washington in, 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 in uh, Barney Frank's office. He was head of the key committee. And I said to Barney Frank, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to reverse the essential legislation of the New Deal to prevent, uh, you know, banks that have the savings of ordinary people 
uh, and allow them to act like commercial banks and allow the commercial banks to actually break down this Glass-Steagall wall and so forth. Why do you want to do that? And he told me, Bob, it's so complicated. I'm going to tell you, here's my aide. Talk to him. And then the aide finally says, well, I really don't understand it, but here's this other fellow. I say, that guy's a lobbyist for the very bank you're trying to save. And it became absurd. And the whole thing was to allow Citibank, right, and travel's insurance to emerge. And then Robert Rubin, a good liberal uh, Democrat, goes to work for these guys once they're made legal. Come on, you know this has been, what do you call it, the public squalor, uh, private Private opulence? Private opulence and public squalor. Yeah, think about it. I mean, what I'm living here in Los Angeles. If I go four blocks in any direction, I see... Thousands of people living under cardboard, for God's sake, in Los Angeles. If in San Francisco, you go to, what is that, World, uh, World Force? What's that big company uh, uh, that has the highest tower? And there's people camped out all night on the streets in the rain. Uh, is this not public squalor? And then opulence? I mean, goodness, you know, the, the income disparity uh, is shocking. And by the way, let me take you back to the university. I didn't mention you're at the University of Texas and so on. But what happened to academic economics and, and public policy discussion? They basically justify all this, don't they? Isn't this uh, so mean? far as I'm aware, I'm in a policy school. And so we are, in fact, uh, concerned with these questions. Whether we understand them effectively and uh, have a, is, is another question. But it is, it is important for the next generation uh, to look around and see what's going on and start to begin to think about how they would deal with it. How are you going to deal with, well, I mean, how are you going to deal with a problem that was that was already uh, uh, very clear to, to Henry George in the late 19th century, progress and poverty? Uh, these two things are going on at the same time. People are being displaced uh, and they are ending up on the street in numbers that we have, uh, you and I certainly did not experience this uh, in the in in the sixties and seventies when uh, you know this this is this is not a not a permanent feature of American life. It's something which has really gotten very aggravated in recent years. Why is that? We need to ask the question, and we need to ask how we deal with it. You know, let me just say, by the way, I'm older than you. I was born in 1936. And as a little kid, my father took me down to the Bowery. My father, well, I was born in the Bronx, and my father lost his job when I was born. So I know bad times in America, and you know. But my father took me down there because we had to go to a special section of New York to see people living in the streets. And even then, there was great alarm about it. That's why you had a New Deal, among other reasons. Sure. Uh, that this was intolerable. Now it's not intolerable. Now it's considered, oh, just a cost of doing good sure. business, you know. Sure. So but your, your, your experience was, uh, you know, part and parcel of the Great Depression. Theoretically, we're not in the Great Depression now. Why is it that we have these problems? What's going on? This is really the pro- something that we all ought to be, you know, asking about and just and, and dealing with in a, you know with a m- much greater sense of urgency that, than I detect right now. So, what's your answer? Because this is you're absolutely right. We don't we're not in this Great Depression, and yet we have more visible poverty. I can't you know I, can't, I was only four years old or something, but I just don't remember it. And we were in pretty poor areas where I grew up. You know, uh, this kind of uh, public squalor, taking your father's phrase, private opulence, public squalor, which, first of all, you would think is a prescription for disaster. How long can that go on? This is how I understand, you know, a, a Trump phenomenon. There's a, there's a lot of people in this country, whether they call themselves Democrats or Republicans, who know it's not working. On the other hand, uh, there's a, 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 a courtier class of people who, you know, you can be an economist at a major university and 
you make 300,000 or 250,000, your spouse makes something equal, and you're analyzing economy, where, where, where we're talking about whether people, whether $15 is a, a living wage? How do you live in Los Angeles or, or New York or anybody, or, or Austin for that matter, where you are, on $15 an hour? It's, it's a prescription for misery and failure and anger and, and feeding racism and division and everything else, is it not? Well, I, I, I do think that a higher minimum wage would, uh, and as a minimum, uh, th- that this would be a step forward. Uh, the federal minimum wage hasn't been raised past seven and a quarter, so it's well below 15. And there are a lot of people around here working for less than $15 an hour. So bringing them all up would be a very substantial step in the right direction. Uh, now, again, do you, does it does it deal with the problem that we're we're talking about, which is of destitution and homelessness, and the effects of the effects of the pandemic, the effects of people being being effectively evicted from uh, their lodgings because the the land has become so valuable that the that, that interest of the landlords to kick them out. Uh, these are questions which need a good deal more, you know consolidated thinking uh, and, uh, you know, priority in public policy. Uh, I have to exercise a certain amount of humility and avoid sort of giving you a pat answer because I'm not sure I have one. In fact, I'm sure I don't. Uh, But I am quite sure that the priority of this question is going to get greater and greater as time goes by. It really is a sign that something is going very wrong. Well, you know, I, I could end it on that note, but since you've indulged me, uh, if you could give me, let's just aim for nine and a half more minutes, so I have a, just an hour of this. I want to end where we began with the Federal Reserve and this emphasis on, uh, you know, driving up right now uh, the cost of things, the cost of things, of everything, in order to contain this thing called inflation and to preserve the dollar, as you say, and the power of the very wealthy. Uh, and so the basic decisions that are being made, and by the way, the head of the Federal Reserve is not even an economist, he's right, he's a different training. Uh, but th- this all, there's a, a mumbo jumbo. What I loved about your father, and very much, I'm, I don't mean to disrespect your books. The books are, by the way, The Predator State, published in two. Oh, eight, and The End of Normal, published in 2016. I recommend these books very strongly, along with The Affluent Society and I forget, The Industrial, what was the other book that you mentioned? By the New Industrial name? State. Yeah, that was a very, very important one. I mean, a whole lot of the discussion about the war and poverty and Michael Harrington, as I recall, your father was the person who took this uh, dismal science of economics and said, no, we can all own it. We can all discuss it. Uh, it doesn't, and this was a time when economics is, the only reason I was studying economics in graduate school is I happened to have been an engineering student. I was good at math. I really didn't know anything about economics, but I could get a fellowship and everything because there was a mystery about econometrics and mathematical modeling. Well, that all turned out to be gimmicks for Wall Street to disguise their lust for profit and creating phony derivatives and everything. But leaving that aside, It seems to me uh, what we're missing in the discussion and what you have in your books is is a notion that this is not a science, really, and it shouldn't be mystified. Uh, There are people who, uh, my slogan is, I always like to know in any story who's getting screwed and who's doing the screwing. And and what, what the question about the Federal Reserve, who is it serving? What is this, uh, you know, just in this conversation, you said, wait a minute, this is bogus. Uh, Wages are not driving everything. They're not the reason we have this inflation. So let's take just the last eight minutes, of seven minutes now, if you'll indulge me, and and tell me what is going on. Yes. Okay, well, first of all, I should say a little bit about my own background in this area, because I went to work uh, for the banking committee in the House of Representatives in 1975, and I was there on and off until the, and in the, over the Joint Economic Committee until the mid 80s. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, we set up a framework for accountability of the Federal Reserve to the Congress. This is the hearings, which now are called the Humphrey Hawkins hearings. Uh, I was the staff person responsible for doing that. Uh, and so 
my take on the Federal Reserve is, 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 first of all, it's an important institution. It is an institution which is governed by law set by Congress. That law gives it responsibility for, among other things, working to maintain full employment as well as reasonable price stability. So it's not just about maintaining price stability, but employment is an important part of its mandate under law. It should take that mandate seriously. It should not simply you know, wave its hands and say, we're following that mandate by doing whatever else we're, we, 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 whatever we really want to do. Uh, they should take that mandate extremely seriously. Secondly, it's a regulatory agency. It should take its regulatory mandate seriously, and it should be operating with considerable independence from the from the people it regulates, which is to say, from the big from the banks, especially from the big banks. This has had, it has historically failed to do. I don't think you can escape from having regulatory responsibilities. The problem is exercising them in an effective and independent way. If you put lobbyists and, and people who take their cues from the banking sector in charge of the of the regulatory apparatus, it's going to come out badly. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the Federal Reserve has been uh, under the influence for a long time now, and really since the early 50s, of the idea that the manipulation of the short-term interest rate uh, is a you know its prime policy tool, uh, and the manipulation of the short-term interest rate is a very blunt instrument. Uh, when they start raising interest rates after having kept them low for a long period of time, they cause trouble every single time. You just can look at this at a map of the of 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 what we call the yield curve, the relationship between the short term rate and longer term interest rates, which get locked in as people take out low interest mortgages and business loans and everything else. Uh, and when when that short rate goes up, the economy tends to crumble. Usually there's a beginning signs of that or some form of financial crisis. Uh, it supports hot money coming into the United States as people take advantage of it. destabilizes many, many things. And that's what's going on now. And the notion that this is a sensible way to run a large, uh, you know, economy at the center of the world system, to my mind, it doesn't, it doesn't hold together as a story. Uh, it may be a way of exercising power in the world. That was a suggestion I make in the uh, in the article. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the minds of these decision makers, but they're they're not. If they if that's not what they're doing, then they're clearly not thinking clearly, in my view, about what their responsibilities are. But maybe they're just trapped in their own rhetoric uh, and are unwilling, and as people often are. Uh, to recognize that they were wrong in making uh, their original assessments and that they should change course. You know, what we're seeing now is clearly something which is going, there's the early phases of big trouble uh, unless uh, some fresh thinking uh, brings to, is brought to bear. Where can that come from? Well, constitutionally, it should come from Congress. The problem that Congress has, and you you uh, talked about this a few minutes ago when you, when you talked about the, the uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall, the problem that Congress has is that it raises too much money from the banking sector. That's what the banking committees, which are where I worked and was very proud to work under Henry Royce and when Wright Patman was still there, uh, has become effectively a, a, just a, 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 a well for campaign contributions from the financial industry. Uh, to a very large number of members who serve on those committees. Uh, and that means that you're not getting the oversight. You're not getting the independent public spirit, uh, public purpose oversight that Congress should be ex- exercising. And that's, that's uh, you know, if you have to ask, okay, what, beyond the Federal Reserve, where's the source of the problem? The source of the problem is that the guardians are not doing their job. So let, one last thought. So people want, are listening to this uh, if they're friends of mine, probably, and this is public radio, they probably think it's really sad that Nancy Pelosi is not running the House now. The Republicans are. Uh, it's really sad that, you know, Joe Biden may not get elected. Maybe a DeSantis will come in. But you're really describing a picture. I know this is, sounds like an old trope, but it's just so depressing because after it was Bonnie Frank, a great liberal, uh, and he was on many issues, 
uh, that I was talking to when he and, and, and Bill Clinton and all has made an alliance uh, with the Republicans in, in the Senate uh, to push through the deregulation of Wall Street. In, incredibly mischievous uh, behavior. And, and, uh, and so people should think how we get trapped into these labels where the real issue is, you know, where is the power? And you described it, the power of the banks, the power of the, of, of the what do you call it, the private opulence uh, results in the public squalor. Is that not really a way we can end this, that if you have... Uh, Essentially right, yes. We have, to, we have to rethink and we have to reorganize, yes. So when you have an alliance of public opulence and, and private squalor, is the re- that's the result. All right, I want to thank you for being so patient with me. And I, I, I just really think that this is, has to be the beginning of people questioning, you know, what, I mean, my goodness, you know, you go to the store now, you get to try to get a car loan. It could cost you 7%. Where did this come from? You know, if you had to have a variable loan, and you thought you had a reasonable mortgage, and now you're going to lose your your life savings and so forth. Uh, yes, you don't want to have a conspiracy theory and think it's just you know this one or that one. The fact is, this didn't have to happen. And I want to thank you for telling us that we have choices, which is. And again, I want to recommend your books. Uh, the Predator State came out in 2008. That's definitely still available. I got an e version of it myself. And The End of Normal, which came out in 2016. These are two absolutely indispensable books. Uh, if you don't read any uh, anything else, these are two books that you got to read if you want to know how the, the political economy works. There's no such thing as the economy. It's a political economy. The decisions are political. There is no, it's not that there's a science that we can you know, respect in any way. And, and uh, for, for, so getting up your, to speed uh, on the political economy, those are uh, really indispensable books. Okay, I want to thank Laura Condesarian at KCRW, the great public radio station, NPR station in Santa Monica, and Christopher Ho for uh, faithfully posting these shows. Joshua Shear, our executive producer, Diego Ramos, uh, who writes uh, the introduction at the Shear Post and Max Jones, who helps with the engineering. And I want to thank the JKW uh, Foundation, which in the memory of a terrific writer and and public personality, Gene Stein, helps support these shows. So thank you, and see you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. Thanks very much.